You've learned all the rules for natural deduction, but how do you actually use them to put proofs together? Let's find out. Hello everyone, welcome back to Attic Philosophy. We are in a series of videos introducing the basics of logic. The last few videos have been on natural deduction for propositional logic. In the previous video, I introduced you to all the rules that you will need. In this video, we're gonna to start to see how to use those rules to construct proofs. So quick reminder, here are all of our rules. We've got introduction and elimination rules for each connective. Here are the ones for conjunction. Here are the ones for disjunction. Here are the ones for the conditional, if then. Here are the ones for negation. And here are the ones for the fulsome constant. That's the constant that is always false. OK, so let's just start off by looking at some examples. Suppose we want to prove this sentence from this premise. OK, so we're going to go from if P then, if Q then R, and we're going to use that to prove, to derive, if Q then, if P then R. OK, so what's happened here is we've got some embedded conditionals and we've swapped around the P and the Q between the premise and the conclusion. So let's have a look at how we go about proving that. So I've written the thing we're trying to prove up the top of the paper here, just so we've got a, a reminder of what it is we're trying to do. But this isn't part of the proof. Let's, before we get going, let's just think about what it is we have to do. OK, so here's our premise. So I've written that at the top of the proof. We are going to try to prove this bit. If Q then, if P then R. And our rule for proving an if then says, assume one thing, the antecedent and try to prove the consequent. So that's what we're going to do. And we're going to do it twice. So we're going to begin by assuming the antecedent. So Q is our assumption. And we're now going to try to prove if P then R within the scope of that assumption that Q. So we're going to do the same thing again. We're going to assume the antecedent. So we're assuming P. This is an embedded subproof within the scope of this assumption. And now we're going to try and prove R. How do we do that? Well, we need to use this premise. OK, here we've got P and here we've got P as an antecedent. So we can use modus ponens. That's the elimination rule for the arrow. And that gives us if Q then R. OK, so that's coming from this line here and this line here using arrow elimination. So we've got if Q then R. Here we've got a Q. We're still within the scope of this assumption here, so we can use modus ponens once again. And that gives us R. OK, here we assumed P and we derived R. So using the introduction rule for the arrow, we get if P then R. And looking at this bit here, we assumed Q, we derived if P then R. So again, using the introduction rule for the arrow, we get if Q then R if P then R. And that's what we were going for. So beginning with this, we have inferred this. We've shown that the premise proves the conclusion. Great. So just to reiterate what our strategy was there, we assumed the antecedent and we tried to prove the consequent. And we did that by assuming this antecedent and proving this consequent. So we're using conditional proof twice, one nested within another. Let's look at a similar example, same premise, but different conclusion. The conclusion this time goes, if P and Q, then R. So this one's going to be quite similar to the previous one. So I'm going to suggest that you stop the video at this point, pause it, have a go at working through this one on your own. And once you've got an answer, check back in and see if your answer agrees with mine. OK, so here's how we do this one. We start off just as before. Here is our premise. So we write that at the top of the proof. Now for this one, it's a simple if then. So we're going to want to assume this antecedent and try and reason our way to this consequent. OK, so let's do that. We assume P and Q. OK, so from there, we can use and elimination to infer P. And we can use and elimination once more to infer Q. 
Now we've got P here on its own and P here as an antecedent. So we can use modus ponens to give us if Q then R. And here we've got Q, here we've got Q as an antecedent. So we can use modus ponens again to give us R. OK, we assumed P and Q, we inferred R. So using conditional proof, that's the introduction rule for the arrow, we get if P and Q, then R. And that's what we wanted to do in the first place. So we're done. I want to talk a little bit now about strategy in constructing a proof. It's one thing to know all the rules and know how to use them, but which rule do we pick? How do we select from the premises or sentences we've derived a rule and know which one to apply at which time? Whenever you're constructing a proof, we're not just going to blindly apply the rules one after the other. We always want to have an aim in mind. We've got to think about a target that we are aiming for. OK, so it's almost like we work from the bottom of the proof where we're trying to get to upwards. So whenever we're doing a natural deduction proof, we have to look at the target. The target, at least at the start of the proof, is going to be the sentence that we want to derive from the premises. So take a look at this schematic example. Suppose we have a premise A and we're trying to prove from it if B then C. What are the overall steps that we're going to try to do. Well, first of all, we're going to list out A as a premise, and then we're going to assume the antecedent B, and then we're going to use the premises plus any other sentences that we've already derived. We're going to use them to help us derive, infer the consequent, OK? Once we've assumed the antecedent and derived the consequent, we can infer if B then C. That's the overall strategy when we are trying to prove an if then. So we won't always be trying to prove an if then, but that's going to come up an awful lot with natural deduction. So notice how I said look at the target and initially the target is going to be the sentence that we want to prove. Once we have assumed B, we then have a new target. We're not trying to get to if B then C, we're now trying to get to C. OK, so our initial target is if B then C. We assume B and then our target becomes C. And if C itself was a conditional, we would assume some more stuff and we would revise our target. The idea there is the target is always getting simpler. With each step we do, the target gets simpler and eventually we're going to get there. So let's relate this strategy to the first example that we looked at just now from if P then if Q then R to if Q then if P then R. What did we do? Well, first of all, we assumed Q and we tried to get our way down to this. OK, in order to get there, we need to infer this bit. How would we get to if P then R? OK, so this is our revised target. How do we get there? Well, we assumed P and we tried to get our way to R. So R would be our revised target. How do we get from P to R? Well, using the things we've already assumed, plus our initial premise, we can use P and P here to get if Q then R, and then we can use the Q here and the Q here to give us R. OK, so that's how that general strategy applies to this example. OK, so with all of that in mind, I want you to have a go at this example. Again, pause the video, have a go, give it a few minutes, and when you've got your answer, come back and see if your proof agrees with mine. OK, so let's have a look at how we do this one. It's going to be really similar to the first example we looked at. It's going to be a little bit more complexity in there because for this one, we're aiming to prove something with three arrows in it. But we're going to start off in exactly the same way. Here's our premise. So we write that at the top of the proof. Our target is this if then. Here is the antecedent and here's the consequent. So we're going to assume if P then Q. And now we're aiming to try and get to if P then R. How do we get to if P then R? Well, we're going to assume P and try and get to R. OK, so here's our assumption. So now we're trying to get to R. How are we going to do that? Well, just like we did before, here's a P on its own. Now, there's two possible applications we could use of modus ponens here. It doesn't really matter which order we do them in. I did it like this. So I used the P here and the P here to give us this consequent, if Q then R. And then I used the P here and the P here to give us 
to give us Q on its own. And then we can use the Q here and the Q here to give us R. OK, so here we assumed P and we inferred R using arrow introduction, conditional proof. That gives us if P then R. And then looking at this part of the proof, we assumed if P then Q, we derived if P then R. So again, using conditional proof, arrow introduction, we get this thing. And that's what we were aiming for. So we have proved this inference here. It's called the distribution axiom. OK, it's saying that the arrow distributes over itself from this to this. We don't really need to know that, but it does crop up quite a bit. So it's nice to have a name for it. So we've seen how to prove a conclusion from some premises. Now let's use the same ideas to demonstrate some equivalences, proof theoretical equivalences. We're going to prove that two sentences are equivalent. When A and B are equivalent, we're going to write that like this. So what we've got here is basically the proof sign and the same sign written backwards. So what we're basically saying with this sign is we can do a proof both ways. We can prove from A to B and we can also prove from B to A. OK, so proving an equivalence is a matter of doing the proof both ways from A to B and then from B to A. OK, so let's have a look at this equivalence here going from a simple conditional if A then B to the equivalent form in terms of and and not conjunction and negation. OK, so we saw when we looked at propositional logic that these things have the same truth table. This side basically says it can't be the case that A is true and B is false. And that's basically what a conditional means. But we're now going to try and prove that not using a truth table, just using natural deduction. So first up, we're going to show that the inference goes this way. And then we're going to show that it goes this way. So to prove from here to here, we're going to assume this side as our premise. And we're going to try to infer this. OK, so because we are aiming to get to something whose main connective is negation, we're going to use the introduction rule for negation. That's reductio ad absurdum, which tells us to assume this bit, derive a contradiction, and that will allow us to infer our target. So we first of all assume the conjunction A and not B. And from this conjunction, I can infer either of the conjuncts. So I can infer A and then I can do modus ponens with our premise to give me B. But then I can infer the second conjunct here there's my contradiction, so I can infer falsum from this contradiction. Since I assumed this and inferred falsum using reductio ad absurdum, it gives us this. And that's what we were aiming for. OK, so that's the proof in this direction. Now we need to do the proof in that direction. It's really similar, so I'm going to hand it over to you. Hit pause on the video, have a go at it. When you're done, come back and see if your answer agrees with mine. So let's see how we would do that. We're going to assume this as our premise and we're going to try to get this as our conclusion. So it's an if then. So we're going to assume A as the antecedent and B, the consequent, is going to be our target. How are we going to get B from this? Well, we don't know what B's main connective is, so we haven't got much of a clue as to what introduction rule we should use. But one rule we can always use in this case is indirect proof. The conclusion of indirect proof is any old sentence A. So the way indirect proof works is we're going to assume not B. And we're going to try and get a contradiction and infer B from it. Now, let's see how we can get a contradiction. Here we've got A, here we've got not B. We can conjoin them together using conjunction introduction. This conjunction contradicts this negated conjunction. So we can add falsum. We assumed not B, we inferred falsum. By indirect proof, we get B. We assumed A, we inferred B, and that gives us if A, then B. So there you go. This proof gives us this direction. This proof gives us this direction. And together, we've proved an equivalence. OK, let's look at another example. Here we've got one of the De Morgan equivalences. Again, we looked at this back in propositional logic. They've got the same truth table. This one says A and B are both false. This one says they're not both true. OK, obviously that's equivalent, but we're going to prove it. So for this one, I'm going to hand the whole thing over to you, hit pause at this point and then come back when you've got your answer and see if it agrees with mine. 
Let's see how I did it. I'm going to run through this one a little bit quicker, starting off in this direction. Take this to be our premise. This is where we're trying to get to. It's a negation, so we're going to use reductio ad absurdum by assuming A or B. Now, the way we're going to deal with A or B is reasoning by cases, the elimination rule for disjunction. So I'm going to first of all assume A, do some stuff, and then assume B, do some stuff, and try and get to the same thing in both cases. OK, so if I assume A, then I can use and elimination here to get not A, and that gives me a contradiction. Doing exactly the same thing after assuming B, I assume B, I infer not B from here, and that gives me a contradiction. I've got a contradiction either way, so I can infer the Folsom constant directly from A or B. And because I assumed A or B and got Folsom, I can use reductio ad absurdum and get not A or B. So that's from here to here. Now going in the other direction, we assume this, and we're going to try and want to get this. OK, so to infer a conjunction, I want to first of all infer not A and then infer not B on its own. How can I do that? Well, not A is a negation. So again, I'm going to want to use reductio. So I'm going to assume A, get a contradiction and infer not A. How am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to assume A, infer A or B using disjunction introduction. Gives me false from here so I can conclude uh, not A using reductio. And I'm going to do exactly the same thing for not B. So I assume B, I infer A or B, I infer from that the Folsom because it contradicts this. That gives me not B following directly from this. I've inferred not A, I've inferred not B, so I get not A and not B. OK, we've shown that these sentences are proof theoretically equivalent. So in those last two examples, I was drawing on the equivalences that we looked at when we did truth tables for propositional logic. So here is a big long list of some of those most important equivalences. Here's an idea. Why don't you work through each one of these equivalences, proving that this side is equivalent to this side. So for each line, this is equivalent to this, this is equivalent to this, and so on. Most of these are pretty easy with short proofs. The distribution equivalences, you might have to do a little bit more thinking there, but it's really good practice. If you can work your way through these, you'll be well on the way to understanding how natural deduction works in propositional logic. OK, so there we've seen how we can prove conclusions from premises and also to show that two sentences are equivalent. There is something else we can do. We can derive new rules from our existing rules. I'm going to show you how to do that in the next video. So that's all for today. If you are enjoying these introductory videos to logic, why not subscribe to the channel? Hit the bell icon to get updates. I'll see you back next time.